Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Mernstat Crash Course. In this episode, we're going to take care of user authentication, which will involve handling a user's collection in MongoDB and building a landing page for users to interact with, where they can create their own accounts and log into the app. First of all, you might be wondering, what actually is user authentication? User authentication is when users have account information that is stored somewhere like in a database, and every time a user tries to log in or access our site, we check their login information against what's in the database to authenticate if they are a valid user or not. If they are, they can proceed to the site, otherwise they won't be able to access it. This also includes restricting user access based on whether they're authenticated or not. The first thing we'll want to do is to make sure our database is able to store users. Ultimately, we need to store user info somewhere, and we already have a Mongo database set up that is connected to our code. So what we can do is just create another collection in MongoDB called users that will store this info. If you're logged into MongoDB and head to the database that we already created, this blog data database, you'll remember that we have this post collection here, which we know stores all of our blog post information. To create a new collection, we can hover over this button here, this plus button, click on it, and it'll bring up this pop-up right here. We want our new collection to be named users. So let's go ahead and type in users in this field here, and then we'll go ahead and click create. Now that we have this user's collection made in MongoDB, we can write code just like we did for the post collection that allows us to create, update, and delete users. All of our backend functionality for dealing with our post in MongoDB comes from this postroutes.js file we made in our backend folder. Now what's nice about these post routes is that the functionality we have for creating, updating, deleting, and so forth is pretty much the exact same functionality that we'll need for doing the same things with users. The only difference is the name of the collection that we're accessing. With that being said, I'm going to go over to our file directory and our backend folder. I'm going to make a new file called userroutes.js that will pretty much just mimic this post routes file. And when I say mimic, I mean, I'm going to go into this post routes file, select everything in here, copy it, and I'm going to paste it right into this user routes file. The big thing we'll need to change is naming the router user routes instead of post routes. So I'm going to go ahead and go into control F here so I can do it more easily. Let's type in post routes. And I'll, every time I see post routes, I want to replace it with user routes. Go ahead in here, click this button to replace all. And now all post routes have just become user routes. And notice here are also in all of our route paths, we're accessing post. And also in all of the collections in here, we're also accessing posts as well. So let's change that as well. So we'll do post like this. Anywhere where we see post, we'll want to change that to users. Let's go ahead and do a replace all here as well. And you'll see now all these routes are users. The last thing we'll need to do is make some changes to our create and update routes. Obviously, it doesn't make sense for a user object to have fields like title, description, content, etc. So let's make these fields new to reflect the fields we'd actually want with a user. For a user, I'm going to make five fields. I'm going to have name for the first one. Then I will have email. And then we'll do password. And then join date. And then lastly, we will also do post. And I want to make sure to change our request bodies as well. So this should be name. This is email. This is password. This one is join date. And then the last one is post. And actually, whenever we create our users, the only information we're going to be grabbing from them directly is name, email, and password. So these three fields right here. The other two fields, join date and post, can just be populated automatically here in our backend. For join date, instead of saying this, we'll just say new date. Which means whenever a user is created, it'll just set this join date equal to the current date and time. And then obviously, whenever a user is first created with their account, they won't have any post at all. So let's actually just make this an empty array. The very last thing we should do is make these same updates for our update route. So I'm actually going to take this object here. I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to paste it in place of this object here. And the only changes here is that whenever we're updating an object, we don't want to set a new join date and we don't want to erase all the posts they currently have. So on these ones, we actually should use something like this, where we have request.body in the name of the field, so we can maintain what we already have. So we'll change this one to join date, and then we will change this one to posts. Now we've essentially just created all the backend routes for our user's collection without having to really write any extra code. The very last thing we need to do before we make sure this works is go ahead and save the file, and then let's head into our server.js file here. And then we'll need to mount the user routes to middleware, just like we did with our post routes right here. So to do that, we can go ahead and import user routes by saying, you can say const, let's say users equals require, that should be dot slash user routes like this. And then all we need to do down here is say app.use, 
and we're going to use users and that now adds those routes to the middleware so our backend will be able to see them as valid routes. Now pretty much all the basic backend functionality for user routes should be taken care of. Just like we did with the blog post routes however, we might find it useful to create front end functions that interact with these routes so that we can just call the functions each time we want to interact with our database. We don't have to worry about accessing these routes explicitly every single time. If we go ahead and go in our file directory here and we find our API file here, you'll remember that we have all these JavaScript functions that call our backend routes. And I'm gonna make something similar for the user routes we just made. For right now, I'm not worried about deleting a user. So we'll first just add functionality to create a user, retrieve a user, and update a user. Because the code for users is virtually the same as the code for posts, I'm gonna go ahead and take the functions that we already have for updating, creating, and getting a post. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it and paste it down here. And then I'm going to rename them so that they all work for users. This one will be get user. This one will be create user. And this one will be update user. And I'll make sure to change these arguments as well. Instead of saying post, they should say user. So this should go here as user. This should be user. And then this should be user as well. Lastly, we'll obviously need to change the actual path of the routes here. So instead of going to posts, we want them to go to users because that's what we specified in our backend. So this should be users and this should be users. And now we should be all good to go. And actually just so these comments are clear, I'm gonna change these to users as well. Users, users, and users. Now that we have these functions ready to go, we can import these functions and call them anywhere in our React code where we want to create or get a user. Awesome, now that's taken care of, let's get started with the actual user authentication aspect of this episode. The way we have routing set up right now, when the app is first launched, the user is directed to a landing page. This is the page where you want to allow the user to log in or create an account if they haven't already. So let's go ahead and actually navigate to the landing page here on our site. And then in our file explorer here, let's actually go to landing.jsx, which is this page here, and let's get to work. First things first, we're gonna need two views on this page, meaning this page will kind of act like it's almost two separate pages. The first view should be the login view, and the second view should be the create account view. This is what most web apps do. Most of the time when you have a login page, there's a button that'll say something like, if you're a new user, click this button to create an account. And you create the account on that same login page. Otherwise, you can just log in like normal, which is why we need functionality for two things, logging in and creating an account. I'm gonna split these two views into two separate React components. That way we can keep them organized a little bit better. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into our components folder here. I'm gonna make a file called createuser.jsx. Then I'm also going to create one called login.jsx as well. And let's actually start first with the create user because we can't log in if we haven't made an account yet. First things first, we'll just write the boiler code for our component. We'll say export function create user. And then for right now, we'll just return empty tags. Then let's import the create user function that we just made in our API. We know we'll need to allow users to create an account, so we know that we need this function. Next, we know we're going to be needing state for a few things, so let's go ahead and import use state from React. Just like we did when we created a post, we can create pieces of state to keep track of what the user is inputting into text fields. This time though, just so I can show you a slightly different approach, we'll handle it as one large piece of state instead of separate pieces of state for each input. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and make a piece of state. I'll say const user set user and I'm gonna set it to use state. And then we'll make the default value in object and we're gonna give it three fields. These fields are gonna be the fields that the user is filling out. So first we will have name, and we'll do this as empty strings for right now. We will have email, and then we will have password. In our JSX, let's make the parent element a form tag. I'm gonna type form in here, and then form down here as well just like we have with other forms. And then with other forms, just like we did with those, we'll give it an on submit tag. And whenever it's submitted, we're going to call an imaginary function that for right now, we'll just call handle submit. And just to make sure that function doesn't stay imaginary, let's go up here and define it. So I'm gonna say um, async function, and then I'm gonna say async function, let's say handle submit. And then we'll do this just so we can be sure that it's actually defined for our on submit tag. Next, let's go inside of our form here and let's add some input fields. So we'll first add an input field that is for the name and we'll make one that is for email and then one that is for password. Let's add a placeholder property in all these so the user can actually see what the fields are. So we'll say placeholder for this one and this will be, um, I said this one, sorry, it was name. Placeholder for this one should be 
email, if I can spell right, email, and then the placeholder for the last one should be password. And just so you can actually see what's happening on this page over here on the left, I'm gonna go ahead and save this file, and I'm gonna import it into our landing page, import create user, and then right here, instead of saying landing page, I'm just going to render the create user component, go ahead and save it, and you can see over here, they're kind of small, but we do have three input fields, one for name, one for email, and one for password. Just like with all our other forms, we'll also add an on change property so that we can update the state each time one of these fields changes. So we'll add on change here, and we'll add this to our other two as well. But let's hold on just a minute. Because we have all of our state in one large object here, we need to modify slightly the way we use this on change property. So let's actually make a separate function up here. I'm going to call it handle change. Let's say function handle change. And each time any of these input fields is changed, let's call that handle change function. So each of these on changes here should have handle change inside of them. Inside handle change, what do we need to do? Well, we know we want to modify the user state up here because that's ultimately what's being modified every time one of these input fields changes. So let's go ahead and call set user. And then because of working with an object, let's start off by using curly brackets to denote that we're working with an object. To update a React state object, we normally need to use the spread notation if we want to maintain what we already have in the object. And spread notation just means adding three dots like this, dot, 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 and then the name of the object in question, which is just our user state. Then to go ahead and update a value in the state, we need to pass in a key value pair that represents the updated value. So if, for example, I wanted to update the name field to Austin, I would do something like this. I would say name equals Austin like this. But we can't just hard code either of these things in this case here, with that being the key or the value, because the key could be name, email, or password, and the value could be whatever we wanted to enter in. So I'm actually going to give this handle change an E argument to represent the event of whatever the user is typing in. We're going to set the name to e.target.name, because that is where the key is going to be stored. And then we will set the value to e.target.value. And again, just so we're clear here, this e is the event object. And to use it, we'll just make sure that we have it as a argument in our definition here. And what's nice about React and JSX is that whenever you call a function like this down here, handle change, I actually don't need to pass an e because it does it automatically for you. This e.target.name right here means we're making the key of our updated value equal to the name of whatever field we're working with. And for this to work, we actually need to give each field its own unique name. And to do that, all we need to do is go down into our tags here. We'll give this one a property of name. And this one actually will just be named as name because that is the name field. And then we'll copy and paste this into here. This is the email field. And then this one is the password field. And then you should hopefully be familiar with e.target.value as it's what you would normally use when we're talking about an on change property. And actually, one last thing, this handle change function, we'll probably need to surround e.target.name here with square brackets to ensure that this gets done correctly and get rid of this error. Now we're done with the on change part. Every time a user changes anything in any of the fields on this page, we're going to call handle change. And then we change our user state to be equal to the current user plus the modification or update of whatever key value pair is in question, which could be either name, email, or password. Let's quickly add some small things to each of these fields. First of all, we're going to add the required property to all of these to make sure that it requires them before we submit the form, meaning it won't let us actually call the submit unless these fields are all filled out. Next, let's give each of these fields a maximum length. For each of these fields, we can add a max length property just like we did with post to ensure a user doesn't try to enter a username that's like a thousand characters long. To do this, we can just add a max length property. And then for example, for our name, let's just set it to 20. Let's go ahead and copy this. Let's paste it in here. For email, let's say, I don't know exactly what it should be. Let's just say 40. And then we'll keep password as 20 as well. And then so we can actually submit, let's go ahead and down here, create a button. Let's just have it say, um, actually I'll say create account. And then to make it call this handle submit function, we'll just have to say type equals submit. I can go ahead and save this page and you'll see this create account button just showed up. The very last thing we need to do on this page is figure out what we're going to do with this handle submit function. We need to actually call the create user function that we're importing from our API when we submit the form. We already have it imported here at the top. So let's just go ahead and go into our submit here. And let's actually just call the create user 
and then pass in our React user state that we've been modifying. And then because create user is technically an asynchronous function, let's add the await keyword in front of it. And I actually want to set this equal to a variable. I'm going to say let response equals await create user. And then with this variable here, let's actually just do some super elementary error checking to make sure it went through just fine. Right now, if we go to our API file, whenever we're creating a user, you can see we're just returning the response here. So that's what we are essentially capturing right here with this variable. One way to check if something went through correctly is to check the status of it. If a request has a status of 200, that means it went through successfully. So let's just say down here, I'll say if response is not equal to 200, meaning something went wrong, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna alert the user and I'm gonna say user account could not be created. Obviously later down the road, we should probably want a more intricate way of checking for the response and making sure it's valid. But for right now, this will do. This just provides a basic alert in the front end to let us know if something went wrong when we tried to call the back end. One thing you may be wondering right now, right now, the way that we have it, we're just uploading a raw password to MongoDB. And this is not a safe practice by any means. There's a ton of different conventions you might have to think about when storing user information. And I'm not gonna go cover all of them, but one very obvious thing you should never do is store raw user passwords in a database or any sensitive information for that matter. If there is some sort of breach of the database, that could mean some bad things. One simple thing we can do with passwords is to encrypt the passwords so that the Mongo database just holds an encrypted version of the password, not the actual raw password itself. There's a few ways we can go about doing this, but one of the easiest ways is by using a library called bcrypt. Bcrypt has functions that allows us to encrypt a password as well as decrypt to validate login information. So to go ahead and install bcrypt, all we need to do is open up our terminal and let's make sure we are CD'd into our backend folder because that's where we want to be installing it. And we just run to write npm install bcrypt just like this to install the bcrypt package. Once you have bcrypt installed in your backend folder, let's head to the user routes file that we made earlier. Go ahead and close this terminal and let's actually import that library. To do that, it's pretty easy. All we need to say is const bcrypt equals require bcrypt. Once we have this package both installed and imported, head down to where we're creating a new user right here. And then we know it's not safe to store a raw password in our database, so let's use bcrypt to encrypt this password that we already have. To encrypt the password, all we need to do is make a new variable to represent our encrypted password. I'm gonna go ahead and say const hash, I'm going to set it equal to bcrypt.hash. Then hash requires two arguments. The first argument is the password we want to hash, which in our case is stored in request.body.password. And then the second argument is what we call salt rounds. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of what salt rounds are, but for our sake, all we need to know is that it's an integer number that is used as an extra security measure. So I'm going to go up here to the top of our file. I'm going to make a constant for that. I'm going to say const salt rounds equals, and let's just set it equal to, let's say six for right now. Then I'm gonna go back down here. And what are we calling it? Oh, right here. And for our second argument, I'm going to pass in salt rounds. This hash method right here, basically all it is, is just a method from bcrypt that turns our password into an encrypted one. And this hash method is actually a asynchronous function. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the await keyword before we call it. Lastly, where we're creating the object to send to our database, we'll replace this request.body.password instead with hash. Great, so now we've got the password encryption taken care of so that we're passing in an actual encrypted password to our database. Here's one thing we should think about before we move back to our front end. Right now, there could theoretically be duplicate usernames in our database or emails because we're not checking for that whenever we create a user. This may cause problems down the road when we try to verify the login. We can add a super simple check for this that'll only take a few lines of code. First, we should make a variable to represent if the uh, email is taken or not, which I will just name, I'll say const taken email. And then we will set it equal to db.collection. We want to look at our users collection. And then we're gonna call the find one method from Mongo. And then for our query, all we're gonna say is find one where email is equal to the email that was passed in from the request, which is just request.body.email. All this line does is collects to our database, accesses the user's collection, and then runs this method called find1. If find1 actually finds something, it'll be set equal to whatever object it found. We're searching for an email field in the user objects that matches what the user inputted in when they were trying to make an account. If this whole thing returns an object, meaning we did find a match, 
that would mean that this email is taken and thus not available. With that being said, I can write an if statement right here and I can say if taken email, then all I'm gonna do is just write a response object. I'm gonna write to the response. I'm gonna say response.json and I'm gonna say, let's give it a message. And let's say the username is, or actually not username, the email is taken. If this right here is the case and the email actually is taken, we don't want the rest of our code to run because we'd still be adding a duplicate username. So let's actually go ahead and write an else statement. And I'm gonna put everything else inside the else statement. This ensures that these chunks run completely exclusively from one another. Now that we have that out of the way, let's go ahead and save this file and let's head back to our landing page and finish up with the functionality to create a new user. And actually let's go ahead and test to see if our ability to create a new user actually works. So in the name field, I'm just gonna go ahead and fill it for email. I would just say austin at outlook.com and then password, I'm just gonna say one, two, three, four, five. And then let's go ahead and click create account. And actually I just noticed it wiped out all of our fields here. So actually to prevent that, I'm gonna go into our code here. And I'm just gonna add one line. I'm gonna add this E. I'm gonna do E dot prevent default. And that's actually how you prevent it from wiping out all the fields. Let's actually now look at Mongo and see if our object uploaded correctly. So let's go ahead and refresh this page here. And hopefully there should be an object in our collection. And clearly there's nothing here. So let's actually go back to our page here. I'm gonna re-enter the information and look at our console. And see if I can see if anything's going on. So to austinalf.com again. I'll do one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna go ahead and have my console open here. Click create account. And then it says uh, 404 not found. Oh, you know what? Actually, I didn't relaunch the server actually after we modified our code. So I think I need to actually relaunch the server and it should run correctly. So I'm gonna go into the terminal where I have the server open. Should be yeah, this one right here. I'm gonna go ahead and control C that and just run the server again. And go ahead and reconnect to the server. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and close this and I'm gonna try this again. So I'll go ahead and close out these errors here. I will click create account and it says user account could not be created. Okay, so I went ahead and did some digging actually and I think the error is right here. This find one method should be an asynchronous method. So I actually need to define this or say await here because I think that right here it says promise pending which means that it's not yet waiting for it to finish before it actually finds whatever it's looking for. So I hope theoretically I should be able to save this Go ahead and close this, reopen the server. And now let's fingers crossed, go ahead and test this. So I'll go ahead and click create account. And it says user account cannot be created still. Let me actually check something real quick. I wanna see, okay, yeah. So it looks like on Mongo, it actually did update our collection here. So it did upload it, but for some reason it's still saying there was an error on the front end side. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this here, save this, go under our create user. I'm going to go ahead and keep this response console logged out and I'm actually going to create a new user. I'm going to say this is just like Sam or something. I'll keep uh, you know, kind of similar. I'll go ahead and click create account. It said user account cannot be created. And let's actually look at our response object here. And it actually looks like, okay, it's not opening for whatever reason, but it looks like our status actually is 200. So I'm not sure exactly why this is running here. Oh, oops, I'm dumb. This should not be response. This should be response.status. Let's go ahead and save this. Hopefully now try again and this should work fine. So it will have just created a SAM object. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a new name. Let's just do David. We'll do David at outlook.com. Go ahead and click create account. And now hopefully no error message. Go ahead and refresh this. And yeah, now we have two new entries, Sam and David. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and just delete these because I was just testing but now we know that it works and the error is resolved. Couple of things to note here. We see that this object has all the fields that we just filled out, plus the current date as this kind of date type string. And then we have an, an encrypted string for our password that has literally zero resemblance to the actual password that we originally passed in. And of course we have an empty post array at the bottom. One super quick thing I wanna mention that's kind of an important thing to notice. So if we go to where we are creating our user, we know that we're encrypting our password before we send it to the database. However, it's not encrypted when we send it between the front end and back end. This means that in theory, someone could be listening for the HTTP request and then actually intercept the password before it gets encrypted and then have access to somebody's account. If we wanted to actually deploy this app and not just work locally on it, we'd want to use HTTPS instead of HTTP in order to encrypt our HTTP request. 
However, this isn't something we're going to worry about right this second. And before we move on to the next part with the login, I want to change this password field here. Normally on most pages, whenever you fill in a password, the password is kind of hidden in a way. So what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to go to create user here and I'm going to make this password here. I'm going to give it a type of password as well. And that should actually hide it. So now you can see the one, two, three, four, five is as those kind of password dots instead of just the raw text. Now that we have the user creation taken care of, the next thing we would logically need to do is create the functionality for users to log in using the information they created their account with. Before we start building out the React page for this, we should ask ourselves how we're gonna verify that a user has the correct login information. Well, we should first check to see if the email they entered in on the landing page matches any of the emails we have in the database, like for instance, austin at outlook.com. If it does, then we should move on to checking the encrypted password. If it doesn't, then we would just say something like user not found. Whenever we first encrypted our password, we use this library called bcrypt. And bcrypt actually has another method used for password checking called compare that just compares an input string with an encrypted string and it compares them to see if they are compatible. Essentially meaning, could this encrypted password have come from this input string? What that means practically is that we could compare 12345, which is the initial password I've made in here, against this encrypted string that we are storing in Mongo. If I ran the compare method with those two things, it would return true because this encrypted string here came from the password 12345. But for instance, if I try to compare this encrypted string against something like, let's say, ABC, then that would return false because they are not compatible. So in summary, compare is a method that we can use to verify if a password is correct or not. In our user routes file over here, we have the functionality to create a user and get a user, but we don't have any routes to verify a login. So let's actually make a new route that we can use to verify a user login. And to do this, I'm actually gonna go to the route where we're creating a user here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and I'm gonna paste it down here at the bottom. I'm gonna say this one is number six and this will be our login route. Typically when you're doing a login verification route, you'll wanna keep it as a post method because we need a request body. So that's what we'll do. Though we will need to change this route name here so that we don't confuse this route with the one that creates users. So for right now, we'll just name this one slash users slash login like this. So if we want to verify a login, we can just call this path right here. We're still gonna need this DB variable to access our database and we're gonna use this taken email as well. Although I'm actually gonna rename this to user instead of taken email. Now I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna delete everything else down here that we just don't need. Now let's think about what we need to do. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but here's what we need to do in this route. We need to check and see if an email matches the email that a user passed in. Luckily, we're already checking for that with this user variable right here, where we're searching our database for that email. If this email is found, we check the password. If it is not found, that means the email doesn't exist and therefore is not valid. If the email is found and the password is correct, we will allow the user to log in. If the email is found and the password is incorrect, we don't allow the user to log in. Simulating this behavior is actually pretty simple with some if else statements. So first I'm gonna say if user, meaning if the user is found, and I'm also gonna add an else statement, meaning the user was not found. And inside this else here, we're just gonna to write to the response body by calling what we're familiar with, response.json. And for this, I'm actually gonna make it an object. I'm gonna give it two fields. I'm gonna have success and message. Success will just be a Boolean, and we'll just say this is false because obviously the login did not go through. And then we'll give it a message too, just so we know exactly what happened. And we will say user not found. If the user is found, meaning we're at this if statement here, then this is where we will look and see if the password is correct or not. I'm going to go ahead and make a new variable in here. I'll say let confirmation. I'm going to set it equal to bcrypt. And then I'm going to set it equal to the compare method that we just talked about. And this is the method where we can compare our encrypted password with the password that the user passed in. And those will be our two arguments for this method right here. The first thing should be the password the user passed in, which is just stored in request.body.password. And then the second should be the encrypted password, which should just be stored in user.password. Since user is this object here that we're obtaining from Mongo, and then the dot password will actually grab our encrypted password string from the database. And just so we don't forget, we'll add a wait in front of this method here because technically this compare method is asynchronous. If the password is validated, meaning this compare goes through and says these two things are compatible, then this confirmation will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. So if we want to simulate the responses here, what we can do is we're going to say if confirmation is true, then what do you want to do? Well, we want to write a response 
that's going to say successful and we're going to return the user else meaning it's false we also want to write a response to show that it was unsuccessful for this first response meaning where the password was successful let's just give it another object and we'll say for this one success is equal to obviously true and then we're going to give the user back to the front end which again is the user from our database and then for this one this means the username or sorry the email was correct but the password was incorrect so i'm going to say success is false and we're also going to give it a message and we're going to say that um we're just going to say incorrect password so basically with this kind of weird looking if and else statements here we have three different possibilities either one the email entered in is not found at all in which case this else will trigger saying that the user was not found in the database the other two possibilities are if the user is found and then if it is found either the password they entered in is correct which we run this code or it is incorrect which is where we run this code so basically depending on if this confirmation comes back true or false will depend which one of these two is returned assuming the user is found in the first place now you might be wondering why am i actually returning the user object here back to the front end in the response where it goes through successfully well we may need some functionality on our site like a profile page where someone can look at their own user information which is why we're returning it back to the front end here so that we can use that user's information however we want and now this route should be all good to go so i'm going to go ahead and save this file here and now that we have the back end functionality to verify a user login Let's head back into our API file so we can write a function in the front end to call this route. I'm going to name this function. I'll say export async function. I'm going to call it verify user. And it should take in a user argument because we need to pass it into the backend route. And then just like we're doing with these other routes, I'm going to go ahead and say const response equals Axios. And it should be a post method. And then we're going to want to call that route, which is going to be URL and it's slash users slash login and remember this response here will be an object that has some sort of success property no matter what it did so what we can do is actually check if there the success is true or false so i'm going to say if and actually make sure we add a wait here i'm going to say if response dot success meaning the success is true and it went through we want to return the information of the user which means we will return response dot data Oh, and I forgot to add this user to be right here. So we're passing it into the request body. And then we'll write an else statement, meaning the login didn't go through successfully. I'm going to actually throw an error. I'm going to say throw new error. I'm just going to say, um, I'm going to actually pass in the status text of the response. This way, it'll basically throw an error and tell us what went wrong in the process. Now that we have this check, this function should be complete. So we've written the backend functionality to verify a user login. And we've also just written the frontend function that calls that backend route. So now we're ready to get back into our React code to implement this. Okay, so let's actually head back to our landing page now. And right now the view that we're looking at here is the view to create our account. And I mentioned on the landing page, you wanna have two views, one where you can create an account, but also one where we can log in. So let's actually go back to our files here. And we have this landing page here that has create user. We also need to develop this login component. And you know I love to copy and paste. So I'm actually going to go ahead and select everything in this file. And I'm actually going to paste it into the login file. And we're just going to change a few things. Obviously, firstly, we'll change this. And then at the import, we don't want to import create user. We want to import the verify that we just made, this verify user. So let's import verify user from our API file. And then for our login page, we're not going to have the user pass in their name, email, and password. We're just going to do email and password. So let's go ahead and have email and password here. And then right here where we're passing a name, we can go ahead and delete that because we don't need their name, just the email and password. Let's make sure all this text will be fine. Instead of saying create account, this right here should just say login and the rest should be, yeah, it should be the same. And we'll just need to change this handle submit function because we obviously don't want to call the create user function. So let's actually change this to verify user. And we still need to pass in the user object, so we'll keep that argument the same. I'm gonna take away this thing here, and I'm just gonna console log out the response. I'm gonna go ahead and save this component. Okay, now if we go back to our landing page, let's actually import this login component. So I'll say import login, and we'll import it into this file. And now, right now, we're just rendering the create user component. We wanna be able to switch between the create user and login component. So how do we do that? One way we could do it is to make a piece of React state that will basically just be a Boolean variable 
that if it's true will mean one view and if it's false will mean the other view. So I'm gonna go ahead and import use state from React and I'm actually gonna make a Boolean variable up here. I'm gonna say const, I'm gonna say, I'll just call it view and set view and let's set it to a default of zero. And just so we're on the same page here, let's say um, if view equals zero, that would mean that we're in the login mode. And if view is equal to one, that would mean we're in the create mode, which means that if we have a default value of zero, the default view will be the login page. And to go ahead and simulate the ability to switch between the two of these things, let's make a conditional statement here. And we'll say if view is equal to zero, actually, let's just do this. If not view, meaning it's equal to zero, that will mean that we are in login mode. So if that's the case, let's do the question mark with the ternary operator. And then we want to render out the login components. Otherwise, we want to render the create user component because that would mean that the view is equal to one or true. So if I go ahead and save this file, you'll see we now just switch to our login view. However, I do want to have the ability to switch between the two views. So let's actually add some stuff in here. So I'm going to add, I have to add these tags here because I'm going to add some more stuff. So I'm going to add this tag, put login in here. Let's do this. And then in addition to having just the login, we want to have um, a button. Let's do a button for now. Let's say button. And then this will say create new account. And this will give us the ability to switch between the other view. And then we'll do the same thing for create user. We'll make these tags here. We'll give it this. And then we will say a button to switch back to the login view. Okay, so now if we save our page here, you'll see how this button that says create new account because we're on the login page. However, this button doesn't actually do anything right now because we don't have any on-click events. So let's add that. So let's add an on-click event. And this will just say that we want to set the view to whatever it is currently not. So I'm gonna say set view to not view. And then we'll do the exact same thing for this one actually. Oops. Do the same thing for this one. And that will do the same thing. If I go ahead and save this, now if I click them, you can see I switch between the two views. So when I first load the page, if I refresh it, I'm automatically on the login page. But if I click create new account, I can go to the create user page. And now we've just simulated the fact that we can switch between our two views however we want. Before we go any farther, let's test out our login. Right now, we're not actually doing anything after we log in besides calling the login route and then printing off the response. Let's see what happens when we try and do that. So for email, I'm going to enter in austin at outlook.com and then password. I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to open up my terminal here and go ahead and click login. And it's saying we're having a 404 not found error. So I'm going to go ahead and actually restart the server just to make sure it's been restarted since we've done our implementation of the login. Go to node server JS, run this again, and let's try this again here. So I'm going to go ahead and do this and we're going to press login. And it looks like we have another error here. It says uncaught and promise error okay in our API file at line 73. So let's look at that. Um, okay, so it looks like it's throwing a file on the error, throwing an error on this right here. I'm actually just to see what this is printing off. I'm going to do a console log. I'm going to console.log response here. I'm going to go and save this file. I'm going to retry this again and see what our response is. Okay, so we're getting something back. Um, we have our data field here, success and user. Oh, you know what? I think I know what it is. Right here, we're saying if response.success, but it should be if response.data.success. So I forgot that data there. And then this, the return should be response.data dot, um, where is it, dot user instead. So let's fix that. Let's do response.data dot user. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And now let's actually try this again here. Let's do a login. And okay, now it actually is printing off the user in our login component, and it looks like we're receiving it just fine. So it looks like the login is working now. I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this console.log just to get this out of the way. And let's head back to our login page. Now that we know we're getting something correct back from the backend, let's take a care of what we should do once the login is correct. And there's two primary things we want to do. Number one is that we want to navigate off the login page and head to the home page. Number two is that we should store the user object in session storage. Let's start with redirecting the user to the home page if they've successfully logged in. This is actually really easy to do thanks to a hook in React Router called UseNavigate. It's basically just a function that you can pass in a route to. 
and it'll take you to that route without having to click anything, which you would normally use a link for. To get that use navigate hook, we can go ahead and go up here and we can just import use navigate and it's not gonna autofill for some reason. We'll say use navigate from, and this is from react router DOM. And then at the top of our component here, I'm gonna write const navigate equals use navigate. If you're familiar with React, you know that hooks can sometimes get problematic when not called at the base level of a component. So it's standard practice for these kinds of hooks to make an alias for them, which we just did with this navigate variable. All we need to do to call this hook is go into our handle submit function here, and I'm gonna go ahead and backspace this. And whenever we wanna call this hook, all we need to do is type the name of the hook and then the route we want to navigate to, which for us is just slash home. But wait a minute, we only want to actually navigate to the home page if the login was correct. If you remember with this verify user function, we are just returning the user if the response went through successfully. So we're already doing the check there, which means if it wasn't successful, this response object is going to be empty right here. So all I need to do to check this, I can just say if response, meaning something came back through, then we can navigate to the home page. Else, if it didn't come through, let's just alert the user and let's say login failed. And now let's actually test this functionality. And real quick, before we do that, I'm actually gonna go in here and instead of throwing an error, I'm just gonna return just to make sure this if works correctly. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. I'm gonna type in something completely random to make sure it's the wrong information. Click login, and it should say at the top, login failed. I can do it with any number of random login stuff. If I just do this, I'll say login failed, login failed, and I'll keep doing that until I put the correct information in. So if I go back to austinatoutlook.com, go one, two, three, four, five, log in, and now it has taken us to our homepage just as intended. Now that we know this is up and running, let me quickly go back to the session storage thing I mentioned a moment ago. I mentioned that we should store the user object in the session storage, meaning in a client's browser session because that will allow us to grab their information if we want. For example, if we were to have some sort of profile page, we need the info of the user that's logged in, hence why we'd want to store their information in the client. And you can actually see your own session storage if you go into your thing here, and you go to this tab application, and you look in this tab right here, session storage, and this is where anything that is stored in session storage will be at. Now, what we could do is just store the user object that logs in in this session storage here. So we could have for a key, let's say like user or something, and then the corresponding value would be like an object. We might say like you know, something like an ID and it's just some random numbers. And then we could have like a view type and we'll say like they're an admin view or something along these lines. However, the problem with doing just this is that session storage is on the client's machine and they have full access to see and edit it. Meaning if I wanted to restrict access to certain pages based on the user object that we have here in the session storage, someone with not so good intent can maybe go into the storage and then alter their own data to try and perform actions they aren't permitted to. Like for example, let's say like when somebody first logs in, they're just a regular user and they have no administrative capabilities, right? They go into their session storage, they see that this view here says user, and they literally just go in here and change it to admin and now they can see all the stuff that the admins can. This is obviously not something you want because it is a security risk. The way that most apps get around this is through what we call an authentication token. Whenever the user logs in, our backend generates an authentication token that is signed with a private key. This authentication token can be decoded to obtain our user data and is stored in our session storage instead of the raw user data itself. This token would be encrypted, meaning it would just look like a random string of letters, like it would look something like this because it is an encrypted string that actually holds our user data. And then what we can do, anytime we want to make requests to the backend that require authentication, we'll pass in this authentication token and our backend will verify that it is valid. If it is valid, we can proceed as normal. But if it's invalid, meaning it's expired or the user has altered it in some way, the backend request will not go through. This is the way that probably 90% of web apps do login verification through some sort of authentication token. Now enough talking about authentication tokens, let's actually implement it in our code. And it's actually very easy to do with just a couple of lines because there's libraries that can handle most of it easily for us. We're gonna use a kind of token called JWT, which just stands for JSON Web Token. And the library we're gonna use is actually called JSON Web Token. So let's go ahead and open up our terminal here. So here, let's CD into our backend folder where we're gonna use this and let's NPM install JSON Web Token, spelled just like this. Press enter and it'll install this library. Once we've installed this library, let's actually go ahead and navigate to our user route here 
and let's import this library at the top of the file. To do that, it's very easy, just like we did with everything else. We'll say const JWT, that's what we'll call it for now, equals require, and we'll do JSON web token. Once we've got that imported, let's scroll down to the route where we're actually logging in a user, which is right here. In our code right now, whenever a login is successful, we're just returning the raw user data right here. Here's where we change that, and instead we want to return an encrypted authentication token. And we'll need two things to do that. First is our payload, which is our user object right here that already exists. And the second is a secret key. Since we already have this user object, let's get the secret key real quick. This secret key could technically actually be anything really. It could be a string of numbers or letters. It doesn't actually really matter. It's just an identifier to let the program know it's you trying to access it. And just so I didn't have to actually write any extra code in our program, I actually found this online node compiler here. And I found this code right here. I'm not sure if you can see it. Let me... Let me zoom this in a little bit, Let's scoot this over. This code right here, it just uses a module called crypto and it basically just makes a 32 byte hexadecimal string that acts as a secret key. So I just had it generate one for me right here in this terminal. You could do the same thing if you wanted to or something like it. Like I said, it doesn't matter what the key actually is. However, it is probably preferable to go a bit longer like this. In my case, it's 32 bytes because the longer it is, the more safer it is in practicality. If your key is something super like simple, like the number five, that can really easily be guessed, which means people can probably bypass your authorization. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy this key here that I just got. And I'm gonna head over into our environmental variables like we made at the very beginning that has our Mongo string in it. So right now we just have this Atlas URI. I'm actually gonna make another one in here. I'm gonna call it secret key. And I'm gonna set it equal to this string that I just got from this little node terminal. And this right here will actually act as my secret key that I use whenever we're getting our JSON web token. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this file here. I'm gonna go back to our user routes. And if you recall, actually, if we go to, I believe it was not server, but it would be um, connect, you go to the top here, Right here is how we're actually importing the environment variables. So let's actually take this line of code. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it and I'm going to paste it in our user routes file here. So I'll paste it just right at the top up here. Go ahead and save this. And if you also recall, the way we access it is by doing process.env dot, and then whatever the name of the environment variable is. In our case, our name is secret key, which means to access it, it would be process.env dot secret key. So with that being said, let's go back into our user routes here. Let's go ahead and scroll back down to the login. Now that we have both our secret key and we also have this user payload, which is our user object, we're ready to create our token. We've already defined JWT at the very top of the file as being the import of the JSON web token library. So let's actually call it down here in our login route where we know the login was successful. To create our token, we just need to write one line of code. We'll just write const token equals JWT, again, calling the JSON web token library, and we're gonna call dot sign because sign is a method from this library that we use to create the token. And we need to pass in three things here. Technically only two, but the third is a optional thing. The first argument is the payload. The second one is the secret key. And the third one is an option that we can use to customize it, like saying how long we want this token to last. So first I'll pass in the payload, which is just our user object. So we'll say user. And then next it is the secret key, which is in process.env.secretkey as we defined it in our environment variable file. And then lastly is the optional customization argument where we can set as an object. And we're just gonna give it a field. We're gonna say expires in, and then we're gonna give it a value of one hour. So basically this token will last for one hour long. And after then it will be expired. And it's just as simple as that. Now what we've done is encoded our user data into this JSON web token right here, which will allow us to save the store user information and the front end. And the very last thing we need to change is instead of returning the raw user object here, we obviously need to instead return the token that we're generating. So we're just gonna replace the user with token. And I believe we should now be good to go. So let's go ahead and save this file and let's return back to our front end to get this finished up. So I'm gonna go ahead and head over back to our login component here. And let's actually now add that token to our session storage so the user can store their own information in their client browser. Before we test this, we need to change one thing. In our API file right here, we're returning the um, response.data.user, but we replaced user with token. So let's actually change this to token. Go ahead and save this file. 
And now we want to figure out how to use sets in storage. And lucky for us, it's actually super simple. If you want to add an item to sets in storage, it's just sets in storage dot set item. And if you want to get something from sets in storage, it is sets in storage dot get item. So what I mean by that is we can just call sets in storage dot set item. And we need to give it a key and a value, kind of like a object. So let's say user, that's what we'll call the, um, the object. And we're just gonna pass in response, which is equal to our JSON web token. So let's go ahead and save this file and let's actually go ahead and test this. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back into our terminal here. And I'm gonna make sure I pass in the correct information. Do one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna log in. And it says login failed. That's most likely because we didn't restart our server since modifying it. So let's actually go back in our terminal. We have our server, let's terminate this. And let's just go ahead and restart it. It's a little annoying having to restart it each time, but it is what it is. All right, so I'll go back, oops. So we'll go back into our console here and let's actually just try this again. And you can see it takes us to the homepage and let's actually go into our application now and you can see if we go into our session storage here, we have this key of user and the value is this super long string. That is actually our JSON web token. And with that, we're actually going to end this episode here. In this episode, we learned how to create a user in our database with an encrypted password and also how to take those users from the database and verify their own login information and give them access to the site. Lastly, you learned how to create an authorization or authentication token for that user and store it in the session storage of the user's client. In the next episode, we'll finish up with the authorization part of our code, which will include us locking unauthorized people out of our site and handling permissions accordingly. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you in the next one.